In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this imperishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, the, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God, who gives us victory through Jesus Christ. That's baptism. That whole text is baptism. It's the shortest sermon you will ever hear. That is baptism. The, imp the, the dead will be raised, and they will be raised to imperishability, especially during all of this insanity with COVID, or however you pronounce it, uh, China virus, or, or whatever you may want to call it. Um, everyone's running out to find different types of food. Uh, the perishable and the imperishable. Uh, a friend of mine who is married to a dairy farmer wrote an article recently about having to pour out a bunch of dairy because it's very perishable. And yet, the Vianney Weenie Sausage Companies are going skyrocket because they'll last them and Twinkies until the Lord returns. Here, we, though, we find much the same thing. It's just not quite as easy pickings as it is when you go to the grocery store. But the reality is that when Christ comes again, the dead will be raised. And I love that imagery because we have our own cemetery out here and the, the actual reality of, of our flesh coming out of the grave in perfection, in other words, sanctity to its fullest, to see Christ face to face and eye to eye, and every pastor who is buried the opposite way gets to say, See, I told you so. And we also inside get to say, Yes. Thank God for the angelic arms of mom and dad who bring their infants to the font. Because when they do, and I go so far as to say that those who do not uh, certainly are on the fringe of child abuse, when they bring the child to the font, they are putting on immortality onto the mortal. They are putting the imperishable onto the perishable. And in that, we find immortality to the mortal. In other words, it's the now and the not yet. Christ is crucified for us. The victory is won. And yet, Satan continues to buffet. He continues to come after us time after time after time. Our own sin conflicts us. The fact that we that we can't meet in the sanctuary is a direct result of sin. Now that's not to say like the kooks who would say something along the lines of, well, because uh, nor, because America sins too much, God's mad and sent COVID or whatever. That's of course not the case. However, we can't deny the fact that that the wages of sin is death, and what comes along with that is sickness. And in that sickness, the body decays and dies. In the old, I don't know, I'm not going to call it old, in the immortal TLH, the burial rite says, when the worms eat 
the the remainder of my flesh in in the German when it eats the remainder of what is in me yet I with my own eyes shall see the Lord it doesn't make any sense to us does it it doesn't make any sense that a body that you saw cold with your own eyes and laid in the ground would be able to raise into immortality. It doesn't make any sense because Christianity doesn't make any sense. As C.S. Lewis once said, if I was looking to Christianity for comfort, well, let me, let me start that quote back over. If I was looking for comfort, I would find it in a bottle of, of old port. I certainly would not advise Christianity. Because Christianity is a life of suffering in the cross. And we Americans have thus far been very comfortable living on borrowed time as far as empires go. And now COVID comes and all churches begin to scream, Oh, we're being persecuted. We're being persecuted. We're being persecuted. Oh, how emails are going out. How are we going to feed our people? How are we going to teach them? How are we going to do this, that, and the other thing? And I say, good. Good. The church needs a little bit of that. The church needs a little bit of persecution so that we understand what the rest of the world's Christians go through. Not only that, but we will, it will tighten our grasp on the cross that has become so laxed over the years in this comfort that we live in. Am I right or am I wrong in saying the fact that we can drive up to communion as irreverent as that may be, the fact that we can drive up to receive the Lord's Supper, it's not really that bad of persecution, is it? Drive up and receive the forgiveness of sins, and yet in other parts of the world, the immortality and mortality thing is rather fleeting. It's, it's right there in front of them. Renounce Christ or lose your head. And we all know what Luther said about that. Take my head, for I have a Lord who upon the resurrection will give me a new one. So, our church needs a little persecution. We need a little discomfort. Why? Because it keeps us from antinomianism, number one. And number two, it keeps us from being too blasé about the gospel. It keeps us from being too comfortable in it as well. Because if we are to take the, the, the gospel for granted, then why come to church? Why are churches dying? And, it's, and churches are dying because of this mentality that God is everywhere and that we can worship Him uh, in any way that we want. And if, and if anyone ever tells you, I can worship God at this place, that place, or the other place, they're not. They're just not doing it. And I hear it all the time. I can worship God just as well fishing than I can in the pew. No, you can't. Because Christ is in his church. Christ is amongst his people. Christ is amongst his own fish. And in that, we understand the sheep shepherd metaphor and the sheep shepherd reality. That is, when Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices, they were going there to basically re-embalm Christ. They were going there to re-spice him 
after Joseph of Arimathea had already done so with 70 pounds of spices and oil. Think about that. So they were going back. They were going back there. And when they got there, once again, Christianity didn't make any sense. They went to look for God and they didn't find Him. Boy, if that isn't an uppercut to American evangelicalism. Where you have to run out and find Jesus wherever you, wherever you can. Or catch Him and put Him in your heart or whatever it may be. How silly we would be to think that we have such power that we could run to the tomb. In fact, I don't want God to be where I want, where I think He should be. I don't want Christ to be in the tomb. Because if Christ is in the tomb, if Christianity made sense, then my faith would be for nothing. And the worms, well, they would be rather happy. But as it is, this flesh, these eyes, the same eyes that were created in Mary and Mary the mother of James and Salome, those same eyes who saw nothing in the tomb will see on that last day the immortality that is placed on each of you who are baptized and believe. And that's what the cross is all about. You see, when we look at the cross, and particularly here in these pieces of art, when we look at the cross, I believe the church started from the crucifixion, not from Pentecost. Sure, they were ordained at Pentecost. But the church started when Christ's side was speared. And blood and water came out. The very things from Christ to wash His people and to feed His people. And that's what we have here in our art artwork. Eki homo. Behold. The man. Salvador Mundi. The savior of the world. And in the middle, there we are the prodigal son repenting and being covered up by grace because of the actions of Christ. You see, it doesn't have to make sense in order to be salvatory. It, the, it, the gospel doesn't have to make sense in order to to save our souls. It just has to be true. And in my life, I have found that most of the things that are true are unreasonable. Marriage, children, even, well, as you're growing up, parents, the most times you have been unreasonable with your parents is when they've been telling the truth. And believe me, the older some of you get, the more you realize they were right. But in the unreasonableness of our minds, have trust and faith in this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And because of that, because of that truth, Christ will not let you go. And that's why, that's why the vigil is so important. Is because we talk about baptism where Christ reaches, reaches into you, into that water, drowns the old Adam, and brings the new up. And laying on the bottom of the font is the old Adam dead. Your sins drowned. And up above comes the new Christian, like the voyage of the Don Treader, when Eustace goes out 
and he's a dragon and then he goes and washes in the pool and he can't seem to s scrape off his scales in the water until Aslan says, I must wash you. And then he does so violently, ripping off his scales. And then my favorite part, Eustace is red and pink like an infant. That's baptism. Baptism is not about the cute dresses. And yes, I put my son in one. It's not about awes. And it's not about pinching of the cheeks. It's about the violence of the cross, the peace of the resurrection, and that both of those together reach into the font and pull you out. Gestation out of the womb into rebirth. And because of that, that which was mortal is now immortal. That which is perishable and will perish will never perish and is imperishable. And because of that, we can say, with the, even with reason and truth, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.